you hear me? Okay, we're going to be moving over now to survey data and not survey side data. Focusing on the gland area. Yes. Uh, we have at the Bern University of Applied Sciences. We have, uh, excuse me, could you please uh, have your private post? Can you please have your private post? I'm going to talk about uh, a survey among uh, lab institutions in Switzerland. We asked them about the readiness and attitudes with regard to open data and crowdsourcing. There's also an interpath, if, if you, especially for the second part of the answer, question and answer uh, section, I think uh, it can be useful. I just um, want to say a few things about the structure of the presentation. Uh, just to give you the background, uh, one, one side of the background is the survey, the other one is the fact that I'm involved in several plan wiki projects in Switzerland and have been in discussions with uh, several more uh, where um, cooperation has been started. Yeah. The focus of this session will be uh, what, we, what can we actually learn from our survey, from the survey results, what are the implications for plan wiki outreach. And I will just run through some of the most important results and then I would like to engage a discussion here uh, around a few theses um, which I will present uh, in the second part of the presentation. So the survey was focusing mainly on the, the two topics uh, that are highlighted in blue, open data and crowdsourcing. Uh, but we also covered aspects of digitization, we covered aspects of uh, cooperation among LAMs, uh, which involve uh, the exchange of metadata, and we also included one question about the, uh, their, the way they perceive open, linked open data and whether they have projects in this area. <coughs> so for the blue, highlighted main topics, we really wanted to know what are the perceived risks, what are the perceived opportunities, where are hindering factors, driving factors, and we also wanted to know what are the expected benefits from the point of view of the glands and who are the beneficiaries. In order to represent the results, we use the innovation diffusion model uh, that was popularized by Everett Rogers. Uh, you, have, you may have seen it, it's this model where you have uh, innovators, early adopters, early majority, uh, the late majority, and laggards, and you can also kind of differentiate between the stages a single, institutions, uh, a single institution actually goes through uh, when thinking about adopting, and then adopting a certain innovation. We have around 1,000 independent GLAMs in Switzerland that are organized in three umbrella organizations with about six to seven hundred independent LAM organizations that are uh, of so-called national or regional significance. And what we did is we, for our sample, we focused on the institutions in the German-speaking part of Switzerland and just on institutions with uh, collections of national significance. So we contacted almost 200 organizations and we got uh, 72 questionnaires completed. So we, you have to keep in mind when interpreting the results that this sample is still quite smallish. It would be nice to have a sample of three to 500 uh, institutions. And what we find out also when analyzing the data is that the archives are overrepresented and uh, museums, for example, they're under just got a, a low return rate from them. We don't know exactly why. Now to give you a general overview of the situation, uh, you can see here that more than half of the GLAMs have at least some metadata available on the internet and also some of the or some of their heritage um, items available on the internet, like pictures, scans. We 
you can also see that almost half of them are kind of cooperating uh, across uh, organizational borders, exchanging metadata. So here, a critical mass of institutions has already been reached. The question remains, what will happen with the laggards? Will they also kind of pick up this these innovations, or will there be institutions that won't make it to really digitize important uh, cultural heritage? Then when you look at open data and crowdsourcing, you see that crowdsourcing seems to have a, a larger number of institutions that have entered the trial stage, so they're kind of experimenting uh, with this approach. Uh, whereas with the open data, that's less or fewer institutions that are, uh, are in this stage. On the other hand, when you look at the yellow parts, you can see that in open data we seem to have uh, uh, more vivid uh, dynamics. And we'll see that also on the, the rest of the results. Uh, probably open data will develop more quickly than crowdsourcing or what we call it sometimes also community sourcing, sourcing or, or uh, collaborative uh, content creation. When looking at linked data, we can see that it's a, a, an issue for quite some institutions, but none of them has had a running project in last <coughs> December when we ran the, the survey. Now, we asked, we kind of analyzed the open data, open content readiness of these institutions, and we can see that only about 1 to 7% of responding institutions actually make their scans of photographs freely available for reuse, also for me, commercial reuse on the internet. Over half of them make them available on the internet but with restrictions and 40% don't make them available at all. But what is more interesting or striking in this uh, study is that over 50% of the GLAMs indicate that they would kind of like to make data available for Wikipedia, but they they don't don't really understand that you would have to kind of give them free also for modification and for commercial reuse. Here you can see the main target groups and the opportunities and risks that we identified with regard to open data. The main target groups are research and education, then you have private individuals and cultural institutions. What ranks much lower are uh, private enterprises, for example. The main opportunities the GLAMs see in this area is better visibility and accessibility of holdings, but also better visibility of the institution itself, and better networking among GLAMs. So opening up the data is really a means of all operate across institutional borders. The main risks are mainly extra time effort and expenses. That's really the highest um, concern they have, the biggest concern. On the other hand, they don't see any, they don't think that loss of revenue is, uh, is really a big risk. It's only very few institutions that indicated that as a risk factor. There are other risks we have to really take seriously when talking to these institutions. Uh, that's uh, mainly can be uh, described as a, loss, a sense of loss of control. So there are concerns with regard, with regard to data protection, copyright, or also secrecy uh, laws. We then also kind of created the desirability index by weighing the risks against the, the perceived opportunities of open data. And you can see that this slide is rather green. I will show you after the slide for crowdsourcing, which is rather red. <laughs> so for over 80% of responding GLAMs, there are more opportunities in open data than risks. And you can see on the right-hand side, that for over 50% open data is actually an important issue. So we expect that we'll have quite some interesting dynamics in this area in the next few years in Switzerland. 
this slide shows you the, their attitudes towards free licensing or by, and also like towards free, making things available for, for third parties. So here you can see like this this clear um, it's like a it's like a ladder or a, we call it a stair a stair. It's like when you ask them about are you ready to share your objects for research and education purposes? It's clear yes, of course. For non-profit projects, yeah, most of them also. Private individuals also. But then when you start asking about Wikipedia knowing that it can be reused commercially, it goes quite a bit down. And if you just ask them about just commercial use, it's pretty much a no. And then on the right hand side we have another problem in the like when you want to use this material from Wikipedia. Uh, they would only like to liberate their words to be used in unmodified form, so it's technically impossible. <clears throat> so what you can see, like, there is a certain readiness to cooperate with Wikipedia, and I think we should focus our communication efforts on research and education, because if Wikipedia is serving research and education, and they will be ready to serve research and education, that might be a good entry point. <coughs> now let's move to crowdsourcing. We captured crowdsourcing practices by two indicators. One is whether they have staff members that contribute to Wikipedia in their working time or also during their leisure time. And here you can see we have 11% of responding labs who actually have staff members using their working time to contribute or to monitor to work on Wikipedia. And it's about the 14% <coughs> on top of that, uh, which have staff members editing Wikipedia in their spare time. We also asked them whether they think online volunteering is important for them. And we have again about 10% of institutions saying yes, it is important. Interestingly, these two factors or these, these two uh, variables don't uh, correlate to each other. So it's actually different institutions saying we have we, we have people editing Wikipedia or saying uh, we appreciate only online volunteering. So they don't make this connect, uh, which I would have actually uh, expected. <coughs> now opportunities versus risks. Like main, the main areas of application for crowdsourcing for the labs would be uh, classification task or completion of metadata. And actually, 50% of the labs they think they have to improve the metadata. And the main areas for improvement are completeness, availability, and digitization. Another area where they think that crowdsourcing approaches could be interesting is uh, transcription and correction tasks. Now you also see a lot of risks or, or uh, drawbacks with regard to crowdsourcing. <coughs> One is again the time effort needed um, for preparation but also for follow-up. There's no guarantee with regard, with regard to long-term availability <coughs> of, the, of the data and its maintenance. The results are, are unforeseeable. You, you get into a project with certain expectations, but what you get out of the project is sometimes something completely different. And it's very hard to estimate the time effort and there is little line security. Now that's the red slide. <coughs> Desirability and importance of crowdsourcing. So the bad news is that they really see a lot of risks in the crowdsourcing. 90% uh, of the clients rate the risk higher than the opportunities and for 50% the risks are really uh, clearly higher than opportunities. Uh, the good news is that on the right hand side <coughs> they still think that crowdsourcing is important. But even those who think it's important they think, uh, think that the risks actually prevail. <coughs> now I have a few uh, 
couple of slides about digitization and uh, cross-organizational cross border cooperation. So 60% of institutions make a available online, 40% still don't. That goes for representations of memory objects, but also for the metadata. 30% they engage in bilateral cooperation, 43% in, uh, in multilateral cooperation. And what is also an interesting aspect is that for almost 30% of the institutions, kind of exchanging metadata with other institutions is uh, one, one of the core missions. <clears throat> now I come to the implications for our Wikimedia Glam Wiki outreach. So, what I kind of take from this data is that in the short term, uh, it's probably worthwhile focusing on just approaches that don't require large or high level of mutual engagement with the community, but to ask them just to simply release content on the free licenses. And I think that Wikipedia and Wikimedia, they have really excellent arguments in favor of the free release of this content. It's for education and research, it's for a non-profit cause, that's what they value really highly, and it's useful. And here I think it's very important that we actually document the use and the usefulness um, when actually data is liberated and we engage in operations. And I also think that Wikimedia can be an attractive partner within the open data movement. So it could make sense to join forces the Open Knowledge Foundation and the National Open Government Data Initiative. <clears throat> now, when it comes to education, inform the information offering uh, efforts with regard to plans, I think we should need to focus on at least four points. One is the knowledge about free licensing requirements, because I guess that some of them just don't know. So that's why they're not freely licensing, but often using these non-commercial licenses. It's also easier for them that they can take decisions more easily internally, but they are maybe aware <coughs> of all the consequences down the road. And we should also give them positive accounts how other institutions actually freely license and can manage to, to deal with all these, these fears that we should. And I think it's also important to give them really the assurance that the data they release, the comments, is actually trackable back to their own institutions, to their own uh, online catalogs, to, to make sure that it also can improve the usability of the institution. And I think we should come up with examples how they can make an, uh, a contribution without any extra effort, just by changing their, their licenses on their present uh, online presences. Then the communication efforts with regard to the GLAMs, I think, should focus on putting uh, kind of cross-organizational themes at the center of our attention by cooperation, by cooperating, and not so much uh, the institu institution itself. And I think we should also kind of make sure that there's a feedback loop so that we can tell them what has been used and how we reuse the content to, to make sure that they can also feed that back to their own financing organizations uh, to tell them that they're, they're actually doing useful stuff here. <coughs> then one insight from the crowdsourcing part is that real cooperation is costly. So it's really important to to have pilot projects and to really well document what can be the, the positive outcomes for a plan uh, in that such a pilot project and the collective learning process is really going on. And then uh, seeing that they are really that the clans are really kind of wanting help in the area of metadata improvement, we should maybe also think about ways how we could assist them and communicate about it. Um, 
and if it's not really an option for the Wikimedia movement to really go down that road, then we should maybe also be clear about that, uh, the fact that this is not really a good option uh, to pursue for a plan. So I think if we're here also in a stage where we're still experimenting around what can work, what doesn't work so well. The same for digitization. There have been a few chapters also engaging in digitization projects. Uh, personally, I'm not sure whether that's really uh, sustainable and has a, a, a great future at a, at a large scale. So that's also something we should look into and then communicate about it here. Yeah, and then metadata is important for GLAM. So increase also the focus on, on GLAM and Wikidata. So I think that could be really a good, a good um, path also to, to follow. So now I think I would like to turn the word over, over to you guys. Uh, maybe you have some comments about this thesis. Maybe you have uh, some own insights you would like to share. Or any questions? We are doing an uh, European project <coughs> called Eagle, which is about uh, epigraphies, uh, inscriptions, and uh, in uh, two years uh, they will uh, we will feed uh, commons with pictures of these epigraphies and all the related metadata, and will be hundred thousands of of items, and so we want to put them in commons, and if we can put them on a uh, wiki source for, for the transcription and the translation and things like that. And yesterday uh, we talked uh, a lot about authority control and um, uh, GLAMs sometimes have these kind of things. They, and Wikidata is a perfect place where to uh, you know, insert this data. Uh, we now have probably every authority control of of Europe, like you know, the the one of Germany, German National Library, and the, the Italian National Library, and we we, we are collecting them. And um, as I said yesterday, there is also another little project which is uh, about Tesauri. Uh, you know, a Tesauro is a controlled vocabulary which suggests you. Uh, um, Maybe, maybe Manuel can explain this better, but it, it suggests you um, prefer terms, broader terms, and we uh, are mapping that with Wiki, Wikipedia. So there are many things you can do. And of course, if it goes to uh, digitization, you can put uh, your scans on commons, you can have everything on Wikisource, but at this very moment, Wikisource has not the infrastructure to handle uh, good metadata. So I wonder how many of these institutions are part of the 
only yes. probably only a few of them. Okay, so since uh, there are some. Yeah. Uh, their data you, your account is all CC0, so it's already open data, but you might not even know about it. Uh, the metadata is actually not so much a problem. The, the bigger problem is the, the representation in this class. So yeah. what we want to have is high resolution scans made available to the Having uh, all the European metadata is on CC0, it's yeah. already much easier for us to work with. Yeah, yeah, sure. But I don't think anyone knows what it is. And we also know that some of our institutions actually have APIs to make their metadata available, but actually only the European know what it's like. European has just recently uh, started a conversation um, asking their stakeholders um, about moving to a, um, a policy that could affect the licensing um, of the actual content and not just the metadata. Um, I mean, we all knew that this is going to happen sooner, but um, uh, it might take some more time uh, to Yeah, I mean, the, one of the big insights was that when you try to reuse this metadata, a lot of people are trying to reuse the metadata that actually want to also reuse the content. And it's it just opened it up much more.
Any other questions? So then I will quickly say what is now, what are the next steps. So we are presently promoting this study or the report of the study on glands in Switzerland, but also among political actors. <coughs> and we will also orient our plan of future according to the findings. And, uh, that means promoting free licensing at a large scale, but then also kind of getting a common learning process going and also examining ways of improving digitization coverage. And we're also looking at the possibility of running this study at a large scale and possible also taking it internationally. So the full study report is available online. You might have seen it already in the, in the session description. And yeah, so if you are interested in some follow-up activities, just contact me if you want to run the study in your country, uh, let me know. There are already a few countries interested, uh, Holland, Australia, um, Hong Kong, that's a country, <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're quite certainly going to do it in three languages in Switzerland. Uh, it's China, yeah, but they say they want us to do it in English, so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, really apply for, for the entire China. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.